This is a tutorial dedicated to basic formal ontology. I'm going to spend the first part of the tutorial talking about BFO quite generally. The initial part will be about why you should be interested in BFO. Uh, then the main part will be an outline of the structure of BFO and how it's used. And the final part will be about the recent updates. Uh, so we are releasing BFO OWL 2.0 finally this week. Uh, we have a new GitHub uh, site in which you can find BFO OWL and BFO OBO. And if you don't know what those are, then I will explain during the break. And um, the uh, documentation that was created already in 2012 is still valid, even though the Buffo OWL, for reasons which I will explain, contains only a part of the uh, content of that documentation. However, there is a Buffo first order logic version which is in progress, which contains all of what is contained in that documentation. And I will again explain all of those uh, aspects if people are unfamiliar with either OWL or OBO or first order logic during the break. So as you can see from the handout, there is a, a, a book which will appear on August the 17th uh, called Building Ontologies with Basic Formal Ontology. The idea behind this book is to illustrate not only what BFO is, but also how you use it to build ontologies. And so I'm going to attempt to uh, demonstrate similarly in this tutorial how you use BFO to build ontologies. Uh, ontology for a long time has been a, an area where, as uh, this uh, um, gentleman points out, uh, an area where people engage in black arts. There, are, there were, for a long time, no rules for building ontologies. People would build ontologies for fun. People would build ontologies without really knowing what other people were doing when it came to building ontologies. And the result was, the result was a, um, uh, a kind of anarchy. So this is linked open data. March 2009, the, the version of linked open data today is much, much more of a hairball than this. At the top, you have the Music Brains ontology, which was put together by teenagers with their rock music collections. And then down here, you have the uh, Protein Database, which was put together by scientists in order to capture information about proteins. And this linked open data was declared to be a great victory for linking and for publishing data, uh, when in fact the links are in some cases very, very weak. Moreover, the virtues of having ontologies for describing data are not really captured here because each area of ontology activity in this landscape builds ontologies in different ways. And so the only way you can take advantage of the linked open data as the experts in linked open data will tell you, is through considerable manual effort, usually involving not sleeping. So the idea behind BFO is that we can resolve this problem of black arts and anarchy and general chaos and wasting people's time by having standards for building ontologies which everyone will share, which everyone will be willing to share because the standards are relatively neutral. And what I, by neutral, I mean primarily domain neutral. That is to say, the same standards can apply in all domains, whether it's music or proteins. As you will see on the handout, uh, John Fox uh, says, I now have a much more positive story for my students because the, the book describes how ontologies ought to be built in a way which seems to be systematic and simple. So the idea behind BFO is that it should be something that everyone can, can get hold of and use in building ontologies so that there is a certain common basis for the ontology building work that they do. Now, the, having said all of that, I'm going to say uh, 
something which will be the nearest that we get in this uh, tutorial to what we might think of as philosophical rocket science. So BFO has a certain background. Uh, the, the background starts with the distinction between universals and particulars, as we say. And that is uh, also describable by using the terms kind and instance. So a universal is a general category, something like mouse or human being or table or planet. And a particular is an instance of a general category. This particular mouse or that particular human being or these particular planets which make up the solar system. Buffo is about universals, but it applies to all the instances of those universals because they are instances of those universals. My view is that all ontologies should be about universals. That's the point of ontologies. Ontologies are designed to capture what is general across a given domain, where databases primarily capture what is particular. And the history of the treatment of universals involved taxonomies of the sort that you find in Linnaean biology. And, and modern-day ontology is uh, recognizably in the same tradition as old-fashioned taxonomies. But modern-day ontologies involve not just taxonomical relations, and the primary taxonomical relation is, is a subkind of. So mouse is a subkind of mammal. Mammal is a subkind of animal. Ontologies also involve other relations, including parthood relations. Leg is a part of organism. Um, every leg is a part of some organism. Also, we have not only part of relations, we have other kinds of relations, including, for instance, topological relations. Leg is connected to torso. Heart is connected to artery, and so on. And then finally, and, and all of these are present in very, very simple forms in BFO, we have dependence relations. Now, dependence relations have to do with, for instance, the relationship between a headache and a head. You can't have a headache without a head. The headache is dependent upon the head. Similarly, your height is dependent on you. So dependence is sometimes also called inherence, and we will meet various varieties of dependence as we go along. Now, all of these ideas are captured in various philosophical uh, works, um, including Aristotle's categories at the beginning, and then increasingly, as time goes by, they are captured in various works in the area of bioinformatics and then also in other areas of informatics. The closest to BFO of all the bioinformatics ontologies developed is the foundational model of anatomy, which both influenced BFO and was influenced by BFO. The one Part of the origin of BFO was a meeting which was held in 2004 in Leipzig. It was called the Formal Architecture of the Gene Ontology. And at this meeting, there was a confrontation, if you like, between the philosophical community, it represented by people like me, and the gene ontology community, rec represented by the leaders in the field of the gene ontology. Um, I gave a talk at this meeting called STOP. Uh, the, these are some of the other talks at the meeting. So Michael Ashburner was there. Susie Lewis was there. Um, some of these other names I'm sure you will rec uh, recognize. Uh, STOP stands for Smart Terminologies via Ontological Principles. And in this talk, I went through the gene ontology and I showed how the gene ontology even though it is a phenomenal success, already in 2004, it was used by many, many people as a vehicle to describe microarray data, genomic data about genes and gene products in many organisms. 
even though it was such a phenomenal success, it was full of mistakes. And these mistakes were very easy to point out, and as soon as they were pointed out, they were recognizably mistakes. So um, one kind of mistake is uh, referred to in the literature of ontology as isa overloading. So you remember I said the main relation in taxonomies is is a subkind of, which is abbreviated as isa. And the problem is that people use isa to mean several different things and not just is a subkind of. And when they do that, then the ontologies don't meld together. We can't integrate the data by using the ontologies because the ontologies are built on the basis of different um, or differently uh, coherent principles. So, and it, these are some examples from the gene ontology as it then was. Lytic vacuole within a protein storage a vacuole is a protein storage vacuole. Now, this is like saying a timeout within a baseball game is a baseball game. It's wrong. Uh, or an embryo within a uterus is a uterus. That's also wrong. Now, the gene ontology made mistakes like this because they were not thinking clearly about the principles which define how ISA is to be used. And BFO is designed to capture those principles. There are many similar problems in the gene ontology as it was in 2004. Since then, it's got a lot better because the people who maintain the gene ontology have accepted these principles. Now, the gene ontology, as I think you all know, consists of three sub-ontologies, a cellular component ontology, a molecular function ontology, and a biological process ontology. Now, cellular components are things like people, mice, and planets, and tennis balls, and tables. Cellular components are things. That means that they endure through time. Sometimes for a longer period of time, sometimes for a shorter period of time. But a cell nucleus will be existing at one time, existing at a somewhat later time, and it will be the same thing, the very same nucleus, which exists at the earlier time and the later time. That's a characteristic of things. You are all things, objects. Processes, on the other hand, do not exist at one time and then at another time. They exist in phases. The phase of a process occurs now, and then a later phase occurs at a later time. The process unfolds through its phases. They have beginnings, middles, and ends. You do not unfold through phases. Your life unfolds through phases. Now, this dichotomy between things and processes is absolutely central to BFO. So this is, this is the, the most basic dichotomy that BFO recognizes, the difference between continuance, which continue, and occurrence, which occur. And this is captured in the gene ontology, as, at least as some of us would interpret it. We have continuance, such as cellular components, and we have occurrence, such as biological processes. Molecular functions are a little bit difficult, particularly because the gene ontology added the word activity to the names of their molecular functions, which makes it look as if molecular functions are actually processes, which might better be called functionings. But don't think about molecular functions for the moment. Think about the function of your heart. The function of your heart is to pump blood. The functioning of your heart is a process of pumping. The function is the same from the beginning to the end of the existence of your heart. So it's a continuant. Your heart's function begins to exist when your heart begins to exist and ceases to exist when your heart ceases to exist. And it's the same function through the entirety of your life just as you are the same organism through the entirety of your life. What we did was we created 
an, a domain neutral ontology which would have the same three part framework as the gene ontology. We have things, attributes, processes. Attributes include functions, things include also parts of things, cellular components, cytoplasm, and so forth. And processes are processes, events, happenings, things which occur, entities which occur. And then there are two kinds of entities, two major kinds of entities, continuance and occurrence. This is pretty much BFO. There is some space and some time. Uh, you can see the, um, uh, on your handout, you can see the current architecture of BFO. It looks more complicated than this, but if you can capture this, you have captured the heart of BFO. The gene ontology was very successful. The meeting in Leipzig occurred in 2004. In the wake of that meeting, there was a collaboration between the originators of BFO and the editorial uh, responsible people in the gene ontology community. And we worked out a strategy to extend the successful uh, achievements of the GO into other areas of biology. This strategy had already been started by the gene ontology, but without the principles for coordinated development of ontologies, which BFO provided. And so we started work on things like the protein ontology, the cell ontology, and so forth. And we created obo, the obo foundry, um, which, which was uh, described in this paper published in 2007, which has co-authors not just from the gene ontology community and from the foundational model of anatomy community, but also from what became the OB, Open Biomedical Ontologies community, and so on. Um, and you can see on your handout a picture of the Obo foundry. Um, this is the original picture that we created. This is, if you like, the 13 original states of the Obo foundry, the, the first colonies that we homesteaded uh, in, in the long march towards taking over the whole of the life sciences and now even further. So the gene ontology is marked in yellow. The gene ontology covers cellular components. The cell ontology covers cell types, types of cells, whole cells. We still don't really have a cellular function ontology. We're, we're beginning to have an organ function ontology. All the other pieces of, the, of, the, um, of this uh, diagram are occupied, more or less appropriately occupied. But the diagram gets bigger as time goes by, but the organization of the diagram remains the same. So we have very small things such as molecules at the bottom, and we have larger things as we proceed towards the top, so that's a granularity axis. And then we have the BFO trichotomy between independent continuance, dependent continuance, and occurrence uh, along the horizontal axis. So these are attributes, these are things, and these are processes. Now, this idea of coordinated development of ontologies, and we can think of these ontologies as modules, so this is modular ontology development. Modules means non-redundancy, the ontologies don't overlap. The cell type ontology deals with cell types, the Go cell component ontology deals with cell components, and those two ontologies do not have any terms in common, in principle at least. So this idea was extended in other areas, um, including the infectious disease ontology. Now we have the plantiome suite of common reference ontologies for plants. And um, in, each, in, in each of these cases, Several of the obo foundry ontologies are taken, but then they're expanded in a granular way in specific areas, for instance, areas of plant science. This is the crop uh, ontology suite. So we have plant trait ontologies for, for many plant species now. Um, we use the phenotype ontology for um, plant attribute, attributes, qualities. We have a plant disease ontology. 
We have a plant development stage ontology. We use the GO biological process ontology. So the reuse of ontologies is part of the methodology here. Uh, we have a plant anatomy ontology. We, we have a, a, a rather a rudimentary plant cell ontology, but we can use also the cell ontology itself, which has uh, a much richer repertoire of cell types, and so on. Um, mole molecules we can, we can just steal. And now the whole thing is being expanded much further. So now we have the United Nations creating an ontology suite uh, which is modeled on the oboe foundry. The United States Geological Survey has just embraced this idea. Uh, the Army, um, uh, indeed NATO in principle, has embraced the idea. And the Federal Highway Administration uh, is working on a suite of ontologies using the same methodology. Now, all of, all of these uh, efforts reuse BFO. So BFO is, is the, the domain neutral core for multiple efforts to create modular frameworks of ontologies which are developed in tandem with each other. Coordinated development of modular ontologies. So this is a, a part of the list. There are now more than 150 ontology groups who are using BFO. And you can find this list on the BFO website. Um, I said that the Oboe Foundry um, framework was being extended. It was extended to include environments with the EMBO ontology. Um, it was extended to include experimental protocols and everything which ha has to do with those processes which are involved when we carry out biomedical investigations in the OB ontology. And then when we developed OB, we realized that we needed an ontology to, for describing information artifacts, such as publications, databases, protocols themselves. And this ontology should not be part of OB because the ontology of publications is, is not restricted to biomedical publications. And so we created the information artifact ontology which it goes here, uh, which is about things like software algorithms, data, publications, footnotes, punctuation marks, margins, HTML pages, and so forth. And the, the interesting thing about IAO, as you can see, is that it broke BFO because Information artifacts are not independent continuance. I'm, my passport is an independent continuum, but the information artifact, which is my passport, is it's a information content rather than information paper. It's not an attribute of uh, an independent continuum in the way that a quality or a function is, and it's certainly not a process. So a publication is not a process. The process of publishing is a process. And so this, is, this, this created BFO 1.1. BFO 1.1 added an extra category in addition to the three we've already seen. And I'll talk about that in more detail in a minute. This is the principle. So BFO claims to be a domain-neutral ontology which can be used for ontology as a, as a top level starting point for any ontology endeavor. But and it claims to be universal, but it doesn't claim to be complete. And if somebody comes along with an, an entity type, a universal or a family of universals, which don't fit into this scheme, then we would be obliged to extend the scheme to, uh, to cope with universals of that kind. So far, we have been forced to extend BFO really only once. Um, we have made a number of changes to create BFO 2.0, but they were not radical changes in the way that this was a radical change. All right, now IAO was similarly successful. So the, the BFO is the most reused ontology of all the ontologies that we know about. 
IAO is almost certainly the second most reused ontology because it's very, very useful for all kinds of informatics-driven science because all such science involves things like databases and publications and so forth. And so this is a, a list of some of the ontologies which, which build on IAO in the same way that the FMA, for instance, builds on BFO. All right, so that's the end of part one, and we'll have a break now for questions, if there are any. Yes? Uh, how do you divide diseases between continuant occurrence? Is it curable or is it occurrence? Nope. Now, all diseases are continuants, as you will know if you get one. The treatment is an occurrence, and every disease has a disease course. It starts small, maybe it's covert, you don't even know you have it. It gets worse and worse. You go to the doctor, he gives you a treatment, and then you die or get better. So this is the summary uh, which distinguishes BFO from other top-level ontologies. Um, so first of all, the BFO is designed to be simple and small. So it, it will never get much bigger than what you see on the top half of your handout because it's designed to support integrating information across domains. And if you have to go through an expensive process of learning a new big upper-level ontology before you can start doing your domain ontology work, then few people will go through that process. So it's deliberately designed to be simple. Secondly, uh, and here we are... are um, taking a, a, a purely practical approach, turning on the fact that the, the ontology of mathematics is very, very difficult. We don't have any terms to describe mathematical entities, such as numbers or uh, Lebesgue measures or Hilbert spaces. Um, so we, we restrict BFO to those, basically to those things which have molecules or perhaps smaller physical parts than molecules or which involve molecules in processes. So we don't have anything which is not involved in a process or has molecules as parts. So no numbers and so forth. No propositions in the logical sense. No meanings in the logical sense. And again, that's because, as philosophers will tell you, the philosophy of language is very hard. Now, we are beginning to extend IAO into an ontology of linguistics, which will include things like speech acts. But that's work for the future. For the moment, we are uh, holding on to this uh, idea that there are no abstract entities within the framework of BFO. Finally, there are, as, as, as should be clear by now, there's no overlap between BFO and ontologies for specific domains. There's no physics in BFO, there's no sociology in BFO, there's no psychology in BFO. The terms of BFO are domain neutral. They're terms like object and process. Now, this, in this, BFO is different from both Dolce and Sumo. So these are the three most used upper-level ontologies. Dolce and Sumo are not domain neutral. Dolce contains a little bit of sociology, um, a little bit of anthropology, human beings, and so forth. Um, Sumo contains a little bit of physics, a little bit of biology, so they have the term crustacean. They are not cleanly separated from domains. Also, Sumo has a lot of mathematics, which makes it somewhat difficult and larger than, than uh, a lot larger than BFO. BFO is a small ontology which has been used in a lot more projects than either Dolce and Sumo. So far, primarily in biology, but now increasingly in other areas. Now, I already mentioned these uh, fundamental dichotomies as the three fundamental dichotomies of BFO. So continuum versus the current, dependent versus independent, and universal versus instant. Now, the instances are down here. 
So this is you and this is me. Sorry, this is you and this is me. And this is me, that this is my arm, my finger moving now. So my finger moving is an instance of process. Now we are concerned about instances, but we represent instances in terms of what is general about those instances, what is repeatable. So finger is repeatable. There are many fingers. And so we have a term finger, which goes under independent continuum. And then all the fingers in the universe are instances of that universal finger that is represented by that term finger. So we have terms in the ontology which represent universals which have instances in reality. And you'll notice that in that statement, I did not use the term concept. And I did not use the term concept just then either. I mentioned it. I didn't use it. I never used the term concept. People who use the term concept are often not clear about what they mean by the term concept, and so I don't use it. And I recommend that you don't use it, and I, but BFO doesn't use it either. All right, now, as I said, we moved BFO, the content of BFO, uh, just this week to GitHub because uh, that, that's where all the other Oboe Foundry ontologies are being moved. And you can find it here. And you can also find details here about the release of BFO OWL 2.0 and BFO Oboe 2.0. The, there are various benefits which are brought about by the coordination of ontologies which BFO makes possible. Uh, and I think it's, it's useful to list some of these. So first of all, when people start building ontologies, they always face the same kinds of problems. And if they can just take BFO off the shelf and use it as a whole, then they don't need to reinvent the same wheel over and over again. They can be assured that they will be using a well-tested framework to start their work. Uh, a well-tested framework in which we've learned lots of lessons and in which we codified the principles which uh, we learned work. And those principles are uh, captured in the book. And you'll see in there that we have a, a two chapters which are devoted to the best practices in terms of simple principles, traffic rules for ontology development. Another benefit is that if everyone shares the same upper-level ontology, then everyone can understand at least the basic structure used by everyone else. So they don't have to learn the internal mechanics of other people's ontologies when they need to use them, because they recognize already the structure. They can also more easily criticize each other's works, because they can see how the structure has been used. And there is no significance in the fact that I put Pato here. Um, it can also lead to innovation. So if lots of people are using the same framework and some of those people discover improvements, then everyone has a better chance of taking advantage of those improvements because they're sharing the same framework. We, we're mo starting to move down the hierarchy. We have what we now call specifically dependent continuance. So your headache is dependent upon your head. Specifically, you can't share your headache with someone else. They have their own headache. Similarly, your skin color is dependent upon you. Somebody may have a similar skin color, even exactly similar skin color, but they still have their own skin color. So that's specific dependent. Now, we distinguish two kinds of specific dependence. On the one hand, there are qualities, like skin color. And qualities are fully there if they are there at all. So your skin color is just there. It doesn't go in and out. It's even there in the dark. But then, on the other hand, there are what we call realizable dependent continuance, which are not there all the time. They're only there when they're realized. An example would be the, f the, the function of your hand to grasp something. This function of my hand is now being realized because I'm grasping something. 
But it's not being realized when I'm just holding my hand loosely in the air. But I still have that function even when I'm not realizing it. So the function is a realizable dependent continuum. And then realizations are functionings, they're processes on the occurrence side rather than on the continuance side. A process of realization is dependent on the realizable dependent continuance such as the disposition, which is dependent in turn on the bearer of that realizable dependent continuance. So my hand has a disposition to grasp things which is dependent upon my hand the processes of realization of that disposition are dependent on both me, or my hand, and on the disposition which they realize. And each of these has instances. So the processes of realization are instances of process, the dispositions are instances of disposition, and the bearers are instances of hand, organism, and so forth. So we can define specific dependence on the instance level, a particular entity depends on another particular entity if the first entity ceases to exist when the second entity ceases to exist. So the disposition of my hand to grasp will cease to exist if my hand ceases to exist. And on the type level, a universal specifically depends on another universal means every instance of that first universal depends on the second universal in the sense defined here. So relations between universals are defined in terms of relations between instances. Now, this is under the hood, as it were. You can use BFO without knowing how to formulate these definitions. But the definitions are there in the documentation. So your temperature depends on you. You are the bearer of your temperature, and it depends specifically on you. It's a quality. The quality of whiteness of a piece of cheese depends on the cheese. The role of the lecturer depends on the lecturer. It's a realizable, specifically dependent continuum. And then uh, the disposition of this patient to get diarrhea is dependent upon the patient. Now. Somewhat more complicatedly, you're examining flies. You're looking at fly eye phenotypes. So you, you see an instance of an eye in a particular fly, and that instantiates the universal eye. And you see that the eye is red. So you see a specific case of redness in this particular eye, and that instantiates the universal red. And then. Red is a color, and eye is an anatomical structure. So when you see an eye, you also see an instance of anatomical structure. And when you see a redness, you also see an instance of color. So instance inherits through the taxonomical hierarchy of the ontology. And at the very top, we have independent continuant, uh, which is the universal in BFO, the universal category to which anatomical structure belongs as a subtype. And we have quality, which is the BFO category, to which color belongs as a subtype. Now we have reciprocal dependence in BFO 2.0. For instance, the hue, the saturation, and the brightness of a color depend upon each other. You can't have the one without having the other two. And now these are the three <coughs> subtypes distinguished by BFO of realizable dependent continuance. Now, this is not necessarily an exhaustive list. There may be other realizable dependent continuance which BFO needs to recognize also. BFO doesn't claim to be complete. It claims to be all-embracing. It wants to be complete. But if somebody needs a fourth kind of realizable dependent continuum, and if they make a good case, then we would add that to the list. Roles, you, under, you all understand, I think. The role of this particular... Uh, water here to be, um, it, well, it's not lunch, but it's liquid breakfast, is something which the water has, but it needn't have had. So roles are optional. Uh, the, a particular virus which infects somebody 
or a particular colony of viruses which infect somebody plays a pathogen role, but they didn't need to play that role. Um, dispositions uh, are, I think, pretty clear. So the disposition of a glyce to break the fragility may or may not be realized, depending on whether you break the glyce. Uh, a risk factor in a disease represents some kind of disposition on the part of the bearer of that risk factor to get that disease. And then functions we've already talked about. So pumping, unlocking, um, grasping, seeing, hearing. Um, and we say that functions are special kinds of dispositions. And we'll come to that in a minute. So these are examples of realizable dependent continuance, and they're all continuance. They're all, they all endure through time, and they get realized in processes of executing, expressing, exercising, manifesting, and so on. And so we can define what it is to be a student. X is a student um, at a given time if X is a bearer of the student role. And the student role is a subtype of the more general type role. This is the way in which BFO deals with those kinds of taxonomies which apply to entities only for certain phases in their existence. So if you're a human being, you're a human being at every point in your existence. If you're a student, you're a student only for some points of your existence. Probably not when you're first born, for instance. Some ontologies don't have this, and so they have, they, they, they have peculiar taxonomies which include employer, employee, patient, organism, all on the same level. And that means that you have redundant hierarchies which brings all kinds of problems, some of which we will recognize later on. Now we have here a definition of role. Uh, roles are externally grounded realizable entities. By externally grounded, we mean grounded in the context, which might be a social context. Somebody is a student because they're in a particular social context. Somebody is a nurse because they're in a particular social context. And they don't have to be in that context. So they can leave that context without being changed physically. A disposition is an internally grounded realizable entity. So it has to do with the physical makeup of the entity in question. You can only have the disposition to grasp if you have a certain kind of physical structure. You can only have the disposition to sweat or to go gray or to sleep if you have a particular kind of physical structure. And you can't lose the disposition without being physically changed where you can lose a role without being physically. And then a function is a, a disposition which is designed or selected for. So it's designed by a designer, for instance, in the case of a laptop or a screwdriver or a table, or it's designed through evolutionary selection in the case of an arm or a heart or a brain. So things have functions only if they are designed or selected for. And as far as we know, there are only two ways in which things can be designed or selected for. Either because they're artifacts designed or selected for by a maker, or because they are parts of organisms, as in the case of the heart or the hand. In addition to the categories which you see on your handout, there are also various relations which BFO recognizes. And we can divide these relations into two uh, families. On the one hand, there are foundational relations, such as is a and part of, which are, um, like the rest of BFO, completely domain neutral. So is a and part of apply to all kinds of domains. But then there are what we call shortcut relations, which are defined in terms of foundational relations for specific domain purposes. So is a membrane part of, it means is a membrane and is part of. That's its definition. And these shortcut relations prove very um, useful when it comes to organizing domain ontologies, but they are 
in principle, eliminable. You don't need them because you can just replace them with the expanded version of the corresponding relation. It, just looking at binary relations, so the, the, the full story here would have to deal also with relations which are more than binary. We have on the one hand relations between types. Human is a mammal. Human heart, part of human. Then we have relations between instances and types. So the, the obvious example here is instance of, but there are other examples such as allergic to, uh, knows about. So I know about uh, furniture. I know about tables. That means I know something about the universal table. And that's the relation between me and the instance and the universal. I guess somebody could love a universal. And then we have relations between instances. Mary's heart is part of Mary, or Mary's aorta is connected to Mary's heart. Now, as I already explained earlier, the type-level relations are, are defined in terms of they presuppose the corresponding instance-level relations. So to say that A is a part of B is to say that all instances of A are instance-level parts of some instance of B. This is the all-sum rule. And it's illustrated by, for instance, human heart, part of human. That's the relation between one universal and another universal. And similarly, to say that A ha big A has participant big B is to say that all instances of big A have some instance of big B as a participant. So, for instance, every case of cell binding has a participant some case of cell. Now, there are problems with what you see on this slide. The first problem is that for continuance, part of is time indexed, in some cases at least. So you may have a, um, a car and you replace a tire. The tire is part of the car, but only for some times in the history of the car. The car has the tire as part only for some times in the history of the car. And now if we add that time index, we turn part of for continuance into a ternary rather than a binary relation. Now that's the problem because OWL, the web ontology language, really only works well for two-place relations. And so we have... Uh, quite considerable and, and quite strenuous efforts ongoing to find a natural way of dealing with part of relations for continuance in a way which will allow OWL to capture the corresponding relational information. And we still have not really succeeded in doing that. We know what the strategies are. There are strategies that they all have problems. Either they are too difficult for normal human beings to comprehend, or they're wrong. <laughs> um, we, we are in the course of uh, working on BFO 2.0 at the point where we are ready to release a compromised version, which is right, which is simple to understand, but which doesn't capture everything that we would like to capture. And you can find that simplified version on the GitHub site that I mentioned earlier. The second problem with assertions like this, so human heart, part of human, is that it's not universally true. There are human hearts which are not parts of humans because they're in freezers uh, or they're in the battlefield lying around. And for this reason, we need to understand how we're going to deal with what is called the canonical. Uh, so this is a strategy underlying many of the ontologies in the oboe foundry. And I think it's a general strategy which has to be adopted in some form by practically every ontology project. And the strategy, which was invented by Cornelius Ross, who was the uh, principal author of the foundational model of anatomy, which I mentioned earlier. And it goes like this. You want to build an anatomy for human beings. And you, you know that all human beings, practically speaking, have hearts, two eyes and two kidneys, a nose, and so forth. 
And so you put all of those things in your canonical anatomy. And you assert universally that, canonically, human heart, part of human. Human being has part, heart, and so on. But then you have what is called instantiated anatomy. And instantiated anatomy is what applies to instances. And whilst in the canonical anatomy, human being has part 32 teeth, in instantiated anatomy, some people, particularly males, have fewer than 32 teeth because they got into fights. To describe instantiated anatomy in a finite time, you need to use canonical anatomy together with relations such as lax part. If you try to describe every possible combination of parts in every instance of the type human being, your ontology would be way too large to be manageable. And so you create a manageable ontology which represents the canonical cases and then you describe the deviations from the canonical cases as deviations from that anatomy. And the canonical here means that which is determined by the canonical structural genes which nearly all human beings share. When we say human heart part of human or human has part heart, we're talking about the canonical human being or that, that which is represented in canonical anatomy. And I think that's a good place to um, pause for questions. So are there questions? Yep. Well, I guess it, this would be a good place to introduce the distinction between reference ontologies and application ontologies. Reference ontologies are typically canonical ontologies. But then people build application ontologies for specific cases. For instance, application to genetic heart defects. And then you use the canonical ontology, but you define the application ontology for the specific family of deviations that you need. There you need to be formally very precise in distinguishing canonical statements from statements in the application ontology, and I'll talk about that later on. The original goal of BFO 2.0, OWL, so the, this, we're talking now about the OWL representation, was to incorporate all the foundation relations into the BFO OWL representation. The compromise is to incorporate only the uncontroversial relations into BFO. The, the more difficult ones are to be found in the relation ontology, which will now be uh, maintained carefully in such a way that we will find it easier to import the final representations of the corresponding relations into BFO OWL 2.1, which will be released in a finite time. All right.